Welcome. This video is going to take a look at chemical reactions, define what it is, look at some of the common uh, terminology used when we talk about chemical reactions, and then finally take a look at how you can write a chemical reaction given the name of the reactants and products that are supposed to be in that chemical reaction. So chemical reaction is a process that involves a re rearrangement in the molecular or ionic structure of substances. So a chemical reaction can occur between covalently bonded or ionically bonded substances. It occurs when atoms rearrange, and that means that the atoms break apart, break the chemical bonds, hold them together, and then recombine or reform new uh, different arrangements with new bonds. So it's always going to produce new substances, and energy is always going to be absorbed or released. It's either going to take more energy to break those old bonds than it does to make the new bonds, or it's going to take more energy to make the new bonds than it did to break the old bonds. So there's either going to be net energy in or net energy out. So it's also the same thing as a chemical change. So when you hear the word chemical change or chemical reaction, they mean the same thing. They're represented by chemical equations. And I often abbreviate chemical reaction as just RxN. So when you see that, get used to seeing it and don't let it confuse you. So how do you know if a chemical change has occurred or not? Well, there's certain things that are good evidence that there's a reaction going on. There's going to be a temperature change. And by temperature change, we mean it can get hotter or colder. Uh, there could be heat so great that you can feel the heat coming off. You don't even need a thermometer to notice. In fact, it might even be flames with it. There's so much heat. Also, it can be light. There could be a color change. There could be an odor produced. There can be a gas or bubbles being produced. Or there can be a solid that appears. And we call that a precipitate when a solid forms in a liquid. Some of these changes also indicate physical changes. So, you know, just a color change that may or may not be enough for you to know that it's a chemical change going on. You kind of have to take it in context with what else is happening. If you put Kool-Aid in water, it's a color change. That's just a physical change, not a chemical change. If you leave a penny out in the rain or, you know, you drop it into the salt water tank and it turns green, in that case, the color change is indicating a chemical change going on. Common terms that you need to know that are used with reactions are, first of all, reactants and products. Reactants are the things that react. They're always shown on the left side because that's the before side. The reactants are the stuff you start with. They're going to combine and react and rearrange with each other, and they're going to make some new stuff. The new stuff is called the products because they're produced. They're always shown on the right side of the arrow or the after side of the arrow. And then the arrow. The arrow separates the reactants and the products, and it means yields or new products are formed. Uh, chemists deliberately chose not to use an equal sign because your reactants don't equal your products. Even though you have to have an equal number of atoms on each side, same kind and same number of each atom, they're rearranged into new products, and those new products have different properties. They're not the same stuff, so we use an arrow instead. And then a plus sign, whether it's on the reactant or product side, is just separating your reactants and products from each other so you can tell where one formula ends and the next begins. The other thing that's commonly used in chemical reactions are the symbols S, G, L, and A, Q. And it's used in parentheses after a formula or symbol. And it just indicates if something is a solid, gas, or liquid, or in the case of AQ, it means it's dissolved in water or is a solution. So three ways to show a reaction. The simplest one that you can do with the least amount of chemistry is just a word statement. Iron, solid iron, plus gaseous chlorine will form iron 3 chloride as a solid. As a skeleton equation, now we use the chemical symbols or formulas for each reactant and product. So solid iron is just Fe, chlorine gas is Cl2, and iron 3 chloride is FeCl3. This isn't a complete chemical equation or a balanced chemical equation. In fact, we don't call it a skeleton chem chemical equation. We just call it a skeleton equation so you realize it's just the bare bones. It's just it's the correct formulas for each thing, but it is not balanced, so it is not a chemical equation. 
balanced chemical equation is actually redundant because the word chemical equation means it is balanced. So you really don't need to include that word. When we say chemical equation, it has to be balanced. So what's the difference? Well, in my skeleton equation, I have one iron on this side and one iron on this side, which is fine. But I have two chlorine becoming three chlorine, and that is not physically possible. So to get it balanced, we need to use these numbers in front called coefficients. So now what my balanced chemical equation is showing me is that I have two separate iron atoms, like so. I have chlorine gas, which consists of two chlorines bonded to each other, and I have three of those chlorine molecules. And together, those two iron atoms and three chlorine molecules can form two molecules that have Fe donating three electrons to chlorine, and I'm going to draw it as if um, it's uh, almost looks like it's covalently bonded, although this can be an ionic bond, so it's donating an electron to each of these. Let's draw it like so. And it's going to have some kind of ionic crystal lattice, and there's going to be two of those. So if you count up, you see I had two iron atoms on the left side, I still have two iron atoms in the products. I had six chlorine atoms on the left side. I have six chlorine atoms in the products. So how do you get from a word statement to these balanced equations? Well, we're going to uh, take a look here in this video how to write the skeleton equation or to get the correct symbols for each thing. So there's four possibilities. Something is either a pure element, and then it's either a metal or a nonmetal. Or something is a compound, and that's either ionic or covalent. So pure elements, you'll know it's a pure element because it only contains one symbol. And even though symbols can have one to two letters, the capital letter is your hint whether it's a new, uh, another element being introduced or just a two-letter symbol for an element, such as Cu for copper. And so if it's an element, you'll be able to find it on the periodic table, and it's going to be a metal or a non-metal. And one thing you should be aware of, well, let me see if I can clean that up there. One thing you should be aware of is when you look at the periodic table, most periodic tables have a zigzag line on them. In this one, instead of a zigzag line, it's got a color differentiation, but I'm going to go ahead and draw the zigzag line in or attempt to. But this side are your metals. I'm sorry, this side's your non-metals. And over here, we have the metals. And you notice metals are a lot more of the chart than the non-metals are. So metals are always what we call monoatomic. They're always represented with just a single symbol, just Fe, never Fe2 or Fe3 when they're all by themselves because they bond metallically in this big C so the simplest ratio is just one. So metals are monoatomic, which is kind of easy to remember because monometals, okay? So metals are always going to be monoatomic when they're by themselves. Nonmetals, and remember that includes hydrogen, even though hydrogen's hiding over here on the metal side. Um, Nonmetals will usually be a gas and diatomic. And if it's not, you'll be told otherwise. You'll be told like, you know, solid sulfur, S8 or whatever. Uh, solid phosphorus, P5, you'll be given a hint as to what it is. And sometimes uh, the diatomic gases are referred to as Brinkelhoff because it includes bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And if you look, hydrogen is there, but the rest of these uh, diatomic gases form the seven right here with nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. So right there is um, six of the seven with the seventh one being hydrogen over here. But other than the non-metals, I mean other than the noble gases, which you're not going to find in the equations that we're dealing with, that's very unusual form, that takes care of most of the non-metals we're going to be dealing with. So if you have one of the other non-metals, you will be told what its formula is, or you can assume it to be diatomic. So then compounds are the other possibility. 
And compounds are when you have two or more symbols written together as a formula. It's indicating that you have a covalent or an ionic compound. So the difference is, is that covalent compounds, remember your hint is that a covalent compound is going to contain two or more nonmetals. There'll be no metal in there. And so the name is going to tell you what the formula is because there's going to be prefixes in it. So I'll make this a little bigger so you can see the covalent. Remember, it is two or more nonmetals. There's no metals in a covalent bond. And so the name is going to tell you the formula with prefixes, such as carbon dioxide is telling you one carbon and two oxygen, whereas carbon monoxide is telling you one carbon, one oxygen. Ionic compounds, on the other hand, do have metals, and in fact, they start with the metal. And so that's an easy way to look at a compound and see, is there a metal there or not? If it is, it's ionic. And in that case, you need to use the oxidation numbers to know how many electrons are going to be gained and how many are going to be lost. And if you didn't figure this out back when we were learning about ionic compounds, the easy way to find an ionic formula is to do what I call crisscross and simplify. For example, magnesium oxide has magnesium with a plus 2 oxidation number and oxygen with a minus 2 oxidation number. So if I crisscross those oxidation numbers, I would bring two down here, two down here, and you take the absolute value. So maybe you want to put this, you know, absolute value crisscross and simplify, which gives me Mg2O2. Well, that can be simplified to just MgO, which is the correct formula. Whereas magnesium chloride, magnesium has two electrons to lose. Chlorine can only gain one. So now when I crisscross, the two comes over here, the one comes over here, and I get MgCl2, and that simplifies remaining the same as MgCl2. So those are your four rules. You have elements, either a monoatomic metal or a diatomic nonmetal. You have a covalent compound that tells you the formula, or you have an ionic compound. And the one, probably the most common mistake is that students want to use the oxidation number when they're doing metals or nonmetals as elements or when they're doing covalent. But there's only one time out of the four different uh, possible substances that you need the oxidation number, and that's only if it's an ionic compound. So to finish up here, I'm going to do an example of writing a skeleton equation from a word statement. And then I've got two of them for you to practice on. So my example says, write a skeleton equation for solid barium and oxygen gas react to produce solid barium oxygen, or solid barium oxide. So there's a reactant, there's a reactant, the and's going to be my plus sign. React to produce, that's where my arrow goes, and then I just have one product. So solid barium, that's an element and it's a metal. So if I look barium up, it is simply Ba, monoatomic metal. Oxygen gas is also an element, but it's a nonmetal. So oxygen gas is going to be diatomic, part of Brinkelhoff, or O2. And then solid barium oxide. Since I have a metal and a nonmetal combining, that's ionic, so I need to look up the oxidation numbers, and Ba is plus 2, while oxygen is minus 2. So if I crisscross, I get BaO2, which simplifies to simply BaO. So that would be my correct skeleton equation. Again, we're not going to worry about balancing them quite yet. That will be the next video. So here's an example for you to try. So go ahead and pause this. And as I start looking at this, I see I have one reactant, decomposes, that's where the reaction's going on, to produce, and then I've got two products. So calcium carbonate, that's a metal with a nonmetal, so it's ionic. If I look up the oxidation numbers, I've got calcium is plus 2. The carbonate is CO3. That has a minus 2 charge. Remember, you have a polyatomic ion chart you can refer to for that. So when I crisscross, 2, I'm going to need parentheses 2. But now that simplifies to just CaCO3. So I actually don't need the parentheses when I write my calcium carbonate. 
decomposes. Calcium oxide, that's also an ionic compound, a metal with a nonmetal. That also crisscrosses to give me two and two. So calcium oxide is also going to be just CaO. And then carbon dioxide is ionic and telling me the formula is CO2. Here's one more example for you to try. So go ahead and pause and see what you can come up with. As I take a look here, I see I've got one reactant, two reactants, react to produce, there's my arrow, and in this case, I have two products also. So my first reactant, solid iron, this is just a metal element by itself, so it's going to be monoatomic, just Fe. And you maybe notice on uh, the example in the previous one, I didn't include the symbols here. At this point, it really doesn't matter if we include the symbols or not. If you want to, go ahead. You'll notice your book does. Aqueous hydrogen sulfate. So if I take a look at this one, um, hydrogen has a plus one charge on it, and sulfate has an SO4 or a minus two charge. And even though this is a covalent substance, this is technically an acid here. I'm going to need H2 SO4 for that to balance. I'm going to need two hydrogen to be able to satisfy that sulfate. And that's going to react to produce aqueous iron 3 sulfate. So now I have Fe with a plus 3. Sulfate is still a minus 2. So when I crisscross, I have a 2 here and a 3 here. So this is going to be Fe2 SO4 parentheses 3. And that doesn't simplify. And then hydrogen gas being a, a diatomic gas, one of the Brinkelhoff gases, is going to be just H2. And that's the beginning of writing chemical equations, or at least how to write skeleton equations. Remember, there's always just four possible rules for writing the formula for any element or compound. Monoatomic metals, diatomic nonmetals, Covalent compounds, which are just two or more nonmetals, where the name tells you the formula. And then finally, ionic compounds, which are a metal with a nonmetal, and you use the oxidation numbers to determine the correct formula.